This week, we welcome back Josh Abraham. Josh is a staff engineer at Praetorian. Does that mean you, you make staff? Do you engineer staffs? Anyway. We'll find out later. <clears throat> He's also known as Jabra and is no stranger to the show, nor the security community, nor writing tools uh, that he gives away for free, which is awesome. So in our technical segment, the illustrious, that's what it says in my teleprompter, Larry. Burgundy ah. reads, it says, illustrious Larry Pesci wow. will give an introduction to FL2K and show us how to set up and use serotipitous transmitter to start your journey. Who put serotipitous in the teleprompter? I can't believe I said that right, not once, but and, twice. In the security and, news. And, and you didn't, it's surreptitious. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Johnny. I do not think you used Thanks, that word Larry, correctly. Thanks, for correcting me. In the security news for this week, we have Microsoft <laughs> Edge flaws, ransomware attacks, Yale, <coughs> vintage Yale University breaches, Reddit data breaches, Linux kernels, and our funny story of the week, week is why people are rubbing toothpaste on their breasts. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Welcome. Did Larry have an introduction? Hi, everyone. This is Paul Asador, and I guess I'm, I'm introducing... <laughs> Apparently, I no longer do. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and I look short. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I accidentally uh, landed in New England and uh, stumbled my way to the G-Unit studio. That's pretty much how I envisioned it happening. Yeah. Job. Well, Carlos, ha save the show, please. <laughs> yes, somebody's got to do it. Oh. Cannot be saved. Uh, well, it's good to have you back, Carlos. Jeff, welcome. Nice to have you in studio. It's great to be here, Paul. Try to stay awake for the whole episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been in studio dropping his We're phone incessantly while we chat. What? what? Where? Oh, hey! I'm, I'm in the studio with you guys. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> the average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. And welcome to the show. But first... Let me introduce you to a man who should ask all about WordPress hosting, Paul Asadoria. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Paul's <coughs> Security Weekly, episode 570. No, Is seriously, PSW at securityweekly.com. Ask <coughs> Paul about WordPress hosting. <laughs> this is what happens when you tell Larry specifically not to bring stuff up on the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's like opposite day. When you talk to Larry, sometimes we'll make it it better. So we're not going to talk about WordPress hosting. Thanks for that, Larry. No problem. <coughs> um, I'm excited to be here tonight, largely because the first two segments, I just get, get to sit around <laughs> and maybe ask some questions and, uh -huh. and listen to everyone else talk, which is great. And then, um, yeah. So here in studio is none other than Mr. Larry The, illust the illustrious. The illustrious. That's, right. That's what the teleprompter says. Yeah, burgundy reads. What, yeah, <coughs> right. What's on the teleprompter? Exactly. Fuck you, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> The Surreptilius. Yeah. The Surrept Pesci. Yes. That. And on the lines via Skype, Mr. Jeff Mann is with us. Jeff, welcome. Hey, everybody. I'm getting in the mood for DEF CON next week. I got my Hawaiian shirt on, and I'm looking forward to being at the cabana. Me too. Me too. And uh, Josh I Abraham is here with us. I might as well introduce him since he's sitting right across from me. I can't help but not stare at him. Good to be in studio. Thank <clears> you so much. Yes. I'm glad you can make it down. This is going to be a lot of fun. Although yes. your demo is not working, dude. No, no. The demo absolutely works. It's the VM that's... Yeah. <coughs> it's the VM. I, right. Right. Yes. It's all those evil people at VMware. It's their fault. I gotcha. Um, Paul, I'm not, I'm not used to seeing the host with a cigar in their face. What's up? Oh, it's sorry. Did you want, is, that, is that better if we cut to Josh's shot? We're still working on this. Is this, 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 yeah, yeah, there we go. All yeah. right. 
See, Rather. it'll just, yes. It's, <laughs> for our listeners, it's, anyway, watch the video. Watch <laughs> don't, the video. Don't make me explain it. Um, <clears throat> so our on-demand uh, material is available at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Make sure that you check it out. And I might as well spread some of the Black Hat and DEF CON announcements out across multiple segments. Um, <clears throat> starting first will be a Black Hat in the pool area. Here's what you do. You can't miss the pool area. It's this big, giant area in, the pool. in Mandalay Bay that has this pool. So there's <laughs> water, and lounge chairs and stuff. If you go out there, you'll see this big black flag with a Security Weekly logo on it. That's where we'll be. How about that? That's a, so do that. That's a good we'll, plan. We'll be there doing uh, trivia. Doug White has written all the trivia questions, uh, as well as uh, other things. Analyst briefings, recorded uh, sponsored interviews. So there you go. And we'll spread that out because we've got a lot more stuff going on, too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then at uh, DEF CON, Cabana as well, right? <laughs> Same thing. Look out in the big pool. At Caesars, you're, you really can't miss the pool. Like, pretty much every window on that side of the building is looking at the pool. So Whether it be the European pool or the, the Pauls, you're pooping in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> every episode, we just we have to talk about pools. Mr. Not Kevin is here with us. What's going on, Not Kevin? Uh, living the dream and the nightmare. Thanks for having me back. And you're, I see you're still incarcerated somewhere because of the bars on the windows. <laughs> yeah, plug windows. Still got it. Still got Did they let you escape and attend Hope and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, for temporarily. Uh, had mm. to come back, unfortunately. You had the ankle bracelet. Yeah, <laughs> <to> ankle <come laughs> back. I, I get it. <laughs> they knew I was back. <laughs> they, knew I was, they knew I was coming. Wait. Wait. That's weird. <laughs> um, so... Josh Abraham is here, and <clears throat> the only thing you told me was, all, and all I remember is Metasploit and the MITRE ATT&CK framework in the same sentence. And I was like, yes, yes, let's do that. Sexy. So that's what we're here talking about. So why don't we do set the stage for us, Sure, Josh. so, so there's, there's a lot to cover. Um, so I guess I'll start with, for those who are not familiar, um, what is MITRE ATT&CK? I think it would probably start there and, and, and talk a little bit about some of the, the previous uh, approaches um, yeah, that we've, like, we've seen. Wait, and why yeah. do we have the MITRE ATT&CK? Like, what sure. problem is it solving? Yeah. I think so I'll, place I'll actually start before even the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So a lot of companies do penetration testing, red team work, um, and a lot of different types of services. And, and the names for these things uh, vary between vendors and sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. So we'll just spell it all out and why you do each of those first so that the definitions are really clear and well understood. And then I'll talk a little bit about MITRE, what it is and, and what we've been doing with MITRE and, and the attack framework. And then we'll talk about uh, Metasploit in terms of its integration and what we've been working on recently. Okay. Um, so first we'll talk a little bit about purple teaming. And so this is a concept of looking at testing an organization's detection controls. Mm -hmm. So you may have an ADR, you may have different types of solutions that are in place. And the organization really wants to understand are those solutions working today? And or is my you know, SOC or network operations team able to see the things that I want them to be able to see? And are there deltas between what they what I expect them to see and you know what they actually see? Right. So it's it's it was phrased to me by uh, Bryson uh, Bort, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, grim, grim. And yeah. then yeah. it's called something different now and I can't I honestly can't remember. Scythe. 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 It's Scythe or Scythe? Scythe. Scythe. You call it what you want, Paul. Okay. <laughs> it's Scythe. The, Bryson Bohr, because right, I can say that, uh, <laughs> described it as basically like, and he, he came on air and described it as like, you know, this company that had sure. suffered a major data breach, went out and bought all those tools after they, <clears throat> you know, did the incident response. Sure. And then like a while later, they were like, we have no idea if something's working or not in terms of protecting us. Right. And they're like, we need something to help us determine if something is actually doing something or not. Right. And then it, it clicked and it all made sense to me. Yeah. So in terms of the um, the industry, we're seeing a shift <clears> towards <throat> detection control. So a lot more organizations are spending more on detection controls. And with that becomes uh, sort of the, the need to test those controls. So you're deploying a lot more controls. Are they working effectively? Are you configuring mm -hmm. them appropriately such that um, we've been working <coughs> on you know, going through and saying, all right, we want to do a purple team. We want to test our detection controls, not incident response, because doing response is a different thing to test, mm -hmm. but looking at our controls, are we seeing the right things? And then are we able to understand where those deltas are such that we right. can focus on closing those gaps? Mm -hmm. Different from a pen test, different from a red team. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we did was we were looking at different options in terms of how do we bring this service and, and 
you know, pushing that forward with our clients. MITRE ATT&CK is, is one of the frameworks that was out there that we adopted to leverage this. So what is MITRE ATT&CK? MITRE ATT&CK is a listing of different uh, techniques that the bad guys are using today, and they're using those to break into organizations. And so what it does for you know a red team or a blue team or even the purple side was to basically categorize, here's all of the different ways in which somebody could break into your organization and gain and achieve their objectives through various means. And so... What? And it, I, I like it because it's not about the vulnerabilities or exploits right. it, or, or even like the, the process. It's all about the method that they're using right. once they're on the system right. or Cause, to gain access. Because you and I, we both know like, you know, vulnerability management is important, mm -hmm. but it's not the thing right. that you're using most of the time, mm -hmm. right? Cause you're not just walking around with like, you know, MS-17-010 or MS-08067 or, you know, all of those vulnerabilities. Most of the time, we don't need to use them right. to achieve objectives. And I think most of the time today, they're... Not so much operating system vulnerabilities that are getting abused. It's more the applications. Right. Because like it's Equifax, for example. Right? Default I mean, passwords are still so common. Yeah, and that it's just like, too. you know, the top five report that we released last year was, you know, looking at here are the ways in which organizations are being breached. Mm -hmm. Now what we can do is say, let's map this to the framework and say, based on this framework, where do these techniques fall in terms of the different components? Are there components in terms of lateral movement that you're missing? And looking at coverage uh, across the MITRE ATT&CK framework, you can say, I have good coverage on everything inside of lateral movement, or I have good coverage in terms of everything mm -hmm. in terms of persistence. I'm going to move on and look at something else. Um, so what we, at, what we at Praetorian did was we actually mapped the MITRE ATT&CK framework to different tiers, because we thought a tiered approach would make a lot of sense, because it's, okay, if I'm a bad guy and I'm trying to break in, what are the easiest things for me to do? And let's work on automating those. Mm -hmm. Push those into a framework like Metasploit. <coughs> and so that basically translated towards um, you know, we're, we're using Metasploit for... No, know, wait, hold on back. When sure. you say tiers, Josh, what, sure. do, what do you mean? What, what are the tiers in relation to? Sure, so it's levels of sophistication for us to be able to automate. So if it's easy to automate, it's tier one. If it's harder... So it's e ease of ease remediation of, overall? No, or? no, no. It's for the attacker. Oh, oh okay. For, if it's easy for me to use and build and automate... As an attacker. As an attacker. I gotcha. That's where I would want to start. Like Bloodhound. Exactly, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So and, it's, it's, and from the defensive side, arguably... The, the one that has the most risk. Because if it's easy to use and easy to automate, correct, should be relatively easy to use. Yeah, and, th and, and, there, and there is also some other factors that go into it. Does this one require user interaction? Mm -hmm. Maybe I rate that a little, you know, a tier two or tier three, because it depends on a user clicking on some sort of thing versus right. something that there's no user <coughs> interaction. Mm -hmm. So like um, one of the frameworks that's been out for a long time, which is the Dread framework from Microsoft, they basically categorize, okay, Okay, this one requires user interaction, uh, and therefore the risk to the organization right. depends on that user interaction. So <clears throat> let's, let's take that into consideration. So we broke it down into four different tiers. And so what we've been doing in terms of Metasploit is automating those different tiers, mm -hmm. and working on the easiest to automate first. A lot of these you know, methods in, inside of MITRE ATT&CK are really, really <coughs> simple to automate. They're just simple commands that you would run on a, on a system, and then additionally looking at some lateral movement techniques. So that in and of itself was mm -hmm. the initial approach. What we saw is that when we were looking at the coverage for MITRE ATT&CK, there were many things that it was actually was missing. And so recently they had, an, uh, they had a release in April of this year mm -hmm. and they put out um, many of the new TTPs, tools, uh, techniques and procedures, we actually contributed back. So like Kerberosting was one that was super important that, them, that, that the MITRE ATT&CK framework have coverage for, because we were using this on the red team side. Mm -hmm. We'd break into an organization, use Kerberos Sting to escalate our privileges, and then be able to achieve objectives in a really stealthy way. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately- And mostly for service accounts today, right? Those are, those, yeah, that's, that's, those that's are a technique. Those are the most Kerberosted. Yeah, Kerberosted yes. accounts. So for those who are, who are not familiar, Kerberos Sting is a, a technique uh, released by Tim <coughs> Dean at, at DerbyCon a number of years ago. Uh, and, and the way in which it works, it, it's actually a pretty interesting and really useful attack for, for a red team. Um, you get access to a system, and you can request on the, from the domain controller, give me all the Kerberos tickets for these service accounts. Mm -hmm. And you can do one, or you can do all of them. And then the response, you, just, you can save that, and you can crack those offline. And those are the actual credentials for those service accounts. Uh, yeah, Tim was actually on the show and gave us the whole exactly history behind it. It's fascinating. So it's, it's there was other people doing similar research. Yep, it's really cool stuff. Yep. So it was a super useful attack vector. Doesn't require much in terms of and that wasn't access. on the MITRE ATT&CK framework. 
previous to the April, April release, yeah. it was not. That's so we contributed back and we were pushing that forward because we want to make sure that, you know, if you're not aware of it, it's not in your threat model, right. you know, the blue right. team can't protect against it until it's in a framework, mm -hmm. then you can say, point to this framework and say, you should you should make sure that this is on your radar and at least now it's in the MITRE ATT&CK framework and putting out tools and techniques and, and different things. You so can't defend against what you don't know about. Exactly, so like pass the hash originally for a lot of companies when they've never seen it, they had no idea. And then it's in the MITRE ATT&CK framework, you can say this is, you know, at least it's there in a framework and then, you know, when, when they see it for the first time, they can say, wow, I need to make sure. Interesting, when, when we talk about patching vulnerabilities, yeah. there's not a great fix or even a good one for Kerberos thing. I mean, when it comes down to it, right, like it's the strength of the password or password rotation on your service accounts? Correct. Basically? Yeah, so you, you really want to have the 25 uh, character passwords for those accounts mm -hmm. and then monitoring the event IDs in terms of Kerberos access. Right, so there's no patch we can apply. There's, like, there, there's, no, there's no mitigation yeah. that actually just changes the way that this works and, so and my fixes point is the problem. That's yeah, what makes exactly, this, right? this exercise very important exactly. because the yep. ways that you know, attackers are breaking into systems. It's supposed to work this way. Yeah, exactly. In which case, something that's supposed there's to no work. Way, way in which you change uh, the Windows environment such that this is not going to be. And uh, so you're, but you're relying on your defenses to detect that behavior or some kind of anomalous behavior. Correct, correct. Basically, because so we get the access mediation to a system. sucks, basically. We get access to a system, we do a curb roasting <clears> attack, <throat> steal the credentials, crack them offline, and then maybe come back later and fish a different user to get access to their system and do the escalation. Mm -hmm. um, so even if I terminate, you know, that access to that initial patient zero, we can still use those credentials to do other things and, and mm -hmm. laterally move. So that sort of set the stage for what we wanted to do. So we looked at, um, you know, based on my background and a lot of the team, you know, we had 10 years of experience doing Metasploit development. Um, you know, I contributed a lot to the Metasploit framework. We use it a lot in internal penetration testing and a lot of various things, demonstrating risks to clients. And so we thought it was the perfect fit for us to be able to say, let's leverage what already exists out there in the community. The con community is contributing to it. Mm -hmm. um, you have the full-time QA staff at Rapid7 doing great stuff there. Um, so being able to take advantage of this framework to be able to push out and automate some of the te te same techniques that we wanted to use on the purple side. Yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a good fit. Yeah. And I think a lot of the other efforts have relied on creating <coughs> your own code and your own framework. Yep. And from experiences of actually some of the staff here at Security Weekly, right? Yeah. Didn't go all that well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's 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 alternative frameworks that are out there for MITRE ATT&CK. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of them are written in actually in Python, and it's strange to say this, and you know I don't know if the users all know, but M Metasploit does support Python code. Mm. So you can actually take code in Python and put it in a Metasploit and modify it slightly and, and make it work. Which this which is, is which crazy is, for me to say because, right. uh, you know, in, in the past I've done a lot of my coding <clears throat> in Perl, but, you know, uh, I, I, say, I, I've both done, of, I've Both done, of these are shocking yes. for, for me because I know you're a Perl guy. Yeah, <laughs> but I, well, it's, I, I also do a lot in Ruby as well. Like I built the uh, initial Nexpos uh, integration for Metasploits. Okay. There's a lot yeah. of stuff that, you know, uh, you may not know about, but it just sort of goes on underneath the hood sometimes. <laughs> and it's not mm -hmm. Pearl. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> so um, with that being said, there's a lot of great work that's oh, being so done. So wait, when you're writing the stuff, is it in Python or is it in Ruby? So it can be in either <coughs> language. It doesn't matter. <coughs> but specifically your for, checks. That wasn't the question. For, for our code base, the majority of it is Ruby, since mm -hmm. that's the majority of what is inside of Metasploit. Uh, there were a couple of modules that were Python. Mm. Yes. Interesting. And that was primarily around uh, the core impact, uh, impact library. Specifically oh, around yeah, yeah, SMB, yeah. yeah, because there's there, you know, re-implementing SMB as a service. <laughs> you hard. don't want to do that. Terrible. So if we can take advantage Terrible. of something like yes. Core Impact, it, it's and another we want to do that. Right? Great melding of technologies there. And so, awesome. um, <coughs> s some other uh, utilities that have also been released recently was um, WMI Exact and SMB Exact inside of um, Metasploit, which is great because you have the ability to move laterally mm -hmm. uh, using those techniques and, and and use that inside of Python. So it's just, it just gives us greater flexibility in terms of the code bases that we want to work with um, and pushing things forward. So what we did in terms of our efforts was looking at those uh, techniques which are in our tier one. And we were focusing on automating of those mm -hmm. first. And so we actually had the opportunity to sit down and do about like a, a number of weeks of work of actually just building out uh, and expanding the Metasploit code base in terms of the MITRE ATT&CK TTP coverage. And so our plan is that we're going to be releasing those back to the community uh, in, in the upcoming months and such. 
And what I'm planning on doing is actually doing a webinar series mm -hmm. uh, and, and blog posts following up to make sure that, that those are well understood, clear, and also um, asking others to contribute as well, because I, I think it's the perfect place to contribute back as a community around uh, these purple team and detection efforts. How difficult are some of the things to run? Like what level of skill do you recommend yeah. <coughs> to start running this in your environment? Yeah, so um, some of these are really, really easy, right? It's just going to be like a single command um, to execute a specific TTP. Like, for example, you can just do like an IP list or, you know, do like, um, you know, some of the most basic, like, like DIR. That's actually a TTP inside of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Mm -hmm. The most simple things. Um, even PS exec as an example, that's a TTP inside of MITRE, mm -hmm. in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And so all you would really need um, to be able to use automation is to just wrap that around, here's the inputs that I need to execute. And so if you can use Metasploit, <coughs> this is going to fit right in line with your, your That's if you existing. can get Metasploit run, which now is is awesome. Well, yep. I mean, because you can just use Kali, and usually exactly. it works pretty well uh, in it's Kali. It's good to go, yep. The thing that's awesome, too, is you can just deploy it as a container exactly. and, and run Metasploit right, right inside of a container, Exactly. which I think is great as well. Take advantage of the, uh, the Debian packages. Mm -hmm. All those years we, we worked on uh, Backtrack. And now we have this great app get upgrade done. <laughs> I can't. I, I can't believe how, how easy it is to just uh, get uh, it up and running like that. Uh, until you, until and you're maintaining a virtual machine for a course, and you need to provide an updated virtual machine to do app get upgrade, app get update, up upgrade, upgrade, and everything works except for one thing. Taking advantage like, of your snapshots. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and it's the one tool that you need for like half an entire day, <laughs> and you spend four hours fixing it. Dependency hell. Do you get the d the app image? Move the old, copy it over, symlink. <laughs> <laughs> there you <laughs> Done. go. Done. <laughs> that took you four hours? Well, I tried all of the real fixes first. <laughs> <laughs> like recompiling GNU yeah. radio with UH without UHD support. Oh, that sounds painful. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Very painful. So in terms of the modules, there's... there's Sorry, yeah, we went off on a tangent should, there. I don't know yeah, where no we just were. No worries. <laughs> it's, it's Bring us back fine. in, Josh. <laughs> so... With the modules and the automation, there were there were a lot of different pieces that we could look at. What did we actually look at, and what did we automate? Um, so one example was the UAC support. And it, so UAC is is a traditional way in which you um, limit your abilities to escalate and gain system access inside of Windows. Uh, and so this this is a newer style technique. And so what we did um, was we actually looked at an open source project, um, and and it, this was out on GitHub. And it, it had a whole bunch of UAC bypasses in, inside of it already. And so what we did was we just wrapped that around some automation to be mm -hmm. able to say, upload this thing to the target, specify the options, and set you up with you know, an interpreter handle mm -hmm. and just pass this over to this already built um, escalation utility. And there you go. You have multiple um, bypasses for UAC already built in. It's good to go, and it works. And it's, uh, it's really just a turnkey thing. And so it's... Uh, it's a huge, <coughs> huge step up in terms of your uh, UAC bypass com capabilities right there. As opposed to just bypass UAC within this point. Yeah, which is, which is one or two techniques type this thing. multiple. But this is like, you have like, I think there's like 40 or so. You know the one I'm talking about, yes. right? Yeah, this is the by bypass UAC, uh, the Acme um, UAC <laughs> bypass. Yep. Yeah. So that, that's a really great technique. In Tier 4... What do sure. some of the methods look like? So tier four is, um, those those get really, really hard. Um, those are, It's like hypervisor style, like zero day vulnerabilities mm -hmm. around um, some really crazy things. Um, NSA level skill um, actor stuff and, and, and just, you know, some crazy ninja um, capabilities and, and just but things that are. You and your team came up with these tiers. This isn't something that might have provided. Yeah, no, this is that's that's a specific tier that, that we have internally on, on our side. Yeah. But um, any organization who can t take the MITRE TAC framework and say, for your business, you know, for your organization, you can map this out in terms of sophistication. What's hard for you, mm -hmm. you're probably going to come to that same conclusion for many of those that were in our tier four. Um, and so what we, what we were doing with the Metasploit automation, some of the uh, TTPs that we had in tier two or tier one, um, you can easily automate, and some of them in tier three with some research, they become easier, mm. right? So like um, one of them was uh, the print monitor uh, capabilities, which was uh, a privilege escalation, or um, uh, sorry, uh, a persistence technique where you upload a DLL to the remote target. Well, with some research, you can figure out that this is not, you know, more effort than you would have thought. 
And then with the Metasploit automation, it actually becomes easier to do. And so therefore you can say, as a blue team or a defender or even a tester for the purple side, um, we, can, we can go through and, and detect uh, this capability or we can't, and now we know that we can't. And so you can, you can put that in the hands of the blue team to be able to make the organization better, mm. understand where their gaps are, and then they can <coughs> improve their detection controls. Have you thought about, uh, when we did a, a pen testing show, Jeff was on it uh, as well, and we talked about a defining a guideline or method or standard, uh, whatever it, it would become, to help us as the pen testers and help organizations assess where they are in their maturity process. Sure. Because that kind of maps into, yeah. <clears throat> like you could almost have like a matrix, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, overlaying these attack techniques sure. with... Sure. Like, how do you gauge the maturity of a program? And sure. we were talking about it in a light that you both are pen testers. Talking about a light when you go to one customer and you're like, yeah, maybe we should just like come and help you do some basic stuff before we even do a vulnerability scan, let how alone about a, a pen how about test. about an architecture review? Yeah, right. <laughs> let alone a red team. Right. And everyone has their different methods of saying, sure. you're a, we need to help you with some stuff first. Versus, uh, yeah, we're going to try and persist in your network for 60 days right. and do the really highly specialized advanced testing sure. and everywhere in between. How do we gauge an organization and then use it to map to these tiers? Sure. So what we do with mapping maturity models, the best approach that we've found has been to use the NIST cybersecurity framework. Mm -hmm. And this really maps out, you know, how are you doing in terms of identify, even the most basic. Do you know what you own? Right. And, and if you start there, a lot of clients are pretty shocked when we say, like, you know, do, do you have an understanding of your assets inside of your organization? I thought I owned WRT54G.com, Larry. <laughs> WRT54GHacks.com. Hacks.com. Yep. I, and, but and I, how, now, how many organizations do you time. find that actually say, yeah, I know exactly mm -hmm. what I own? <clears throat> no one. <laughs> <laughs> or they think they do. <laughs> they think they do. So they think they do. And then you get into the discussions about yeah. what are they actually. Yeah. Uh, like, hold on. Let me run a quick command. Yeah. Let me run, you know, fierce or whatnot. Yeah. And, you know, so, some some other utilities to be able to say what is actually out there. Yeah. Um, you know that that's that's a level of maturity that you know you need to push forward on. Mm -hmm. But being able to map it out to the NIST CSF, we found to be the best approach because there, there's a lot of different categories. There's a lot of things that um, the shift from the identify and protect to the detection and response. Mm -hmm. um, as I was saying earlier, you know, we're seeing that shift in terms of the enterprise moving towards more detection and response. So where does this fall? Um, obviously the purple team is all detection, right? Not so much response because we're right. responding but to things. Very um, separate things, right? Yeah, because completely the, different things. So you can have be really good on protection and identify and then really bad on detection and response. But if you're really bad just across the board, at least knowing that, yeah. then you know where to start because you can use the framework to say, well, if I have, if I have nothing and I know that I'm really terrible then you can ha use that framework to say, where can I focus my efforts first to be able to maximize the ROI versus yeah, we just this, going uh, to the... conversation yesterday in a business context sure. about, you know, like if we increase or, you know, take on more things here, mm -hmm. but our processes aren't in line to, to handle all those new things, like we need to make sure our processes are sound first before we start go building it out and putting a lot of pressure on our processes. It's the same thing when we talk about something like detect and response. If you increase your detection, mm -hmm and you're filing 8 million tickets with security incidents, How if do you, you don't have your it? response, you know, then what's the point, yeah. right? Because you're not yeah. going to get to all yeah. the things that, that you're detecting. Exactly. So you, you need to be able to um, build you know, the, the noise uh, frequency ratio and mm -hmm. all of that so such that you're not just overwhelming your team with you know, just noise. These are, these are valuable things to be able to look at. Well, but, but if there's no response, you want to be could, able to, to tune you it. You probably that point out a couple of dozen things that are really our problems. And yeah. they're like, oh, I don't know yeah. how to respond let's to just, even one of those. Let's just fix 12. some of these yeah. things and really focus the efforts. Because you can't tackle everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And when organizations try to say, we're going to fix everything, boil the ocean all at once, mm -hmm. really quickly, you know, it's, a, it's setting themselves up for failure. So the prioritized approach using <coughs> a specific framework, NIST CSF, MITRE ATT&CK framework, those are two actionable things that you can do today if you have no idea where you sit in terms of your organization's security proce mm -hmm. process and procedure. Um, so for those organizations who have no clue, that's the place to start first. Uh, and, then, and then in terms of like you know, protection controls, there's a whole bunch mm. that you can do. And then this is more on the detection side. You know, do you have a SIM in place or an EDR product or something that you should be able to at least see some activity? You don't necessarily have to have a network operations center mm -hmm. to do a, a, a purple team style engagement, but do you have 
some endpoint visibility at all. And really just understanding what that is in the deltas of uh, those assumptions. How many <coughs> people do you think are aware of the NIST cybersecurity framework that you talked about um, that helps you gauge your maturity model? I, I'm sorry, I forget which one it, it was, but, and the minor attack framework. Like, I feel like a lot of organizations haven't adopted these practices. Yeah, yet. it's. There's there's a lot of organizations that, that <coughs> haven't uh, haven't adopted these, and so that's you know one of the reasons to, to talk about them more. And obviously at Black Hat, that's you know Black Hat, DefCon, Vegas, uh, and Summer Camp, um, definitely great opportunities for everybody to share that information, share that knowledge. I think certainly the MITRE ATT&CK framework has seen an explosion in, in popularity, especially Absolutely. in the past eight months or so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a lot of organizations are shifting their spend towards detection, and therefore validating those assumptions in terms of those spend, mm -hmm. did I actually get a return for my investment? Right. And then measuring that return to be able to present it to the board, to be able to say yes or no, I need to kick my vendor out and switch vendors right. because they're, you know, they're crap. Or it helps or, avoid shelfware too. Yeah, exactly. Like I deployed the solution and yeah, yeah it was too, too hard, couldn't figure it out, didn't have time, whatever. And or I like put it in a default configuration and it doesn't do much right. because we didn't tune it right. Or Maybe it does, and you didn't connect it to this other thing, which is where you get all your logs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both are good to know. It's important to have a WAF. Yeah. That's what not Kevin tells me. That'll fix all your web app phones. That's right. <coughs> <laughs> well, Ke it at least give you virtual over. patches. <laughs> Kevin's over there laughing. <laughs> fix your He's, on <laughs> He's on mute. He's on mute. Oh, I was just waffing it up over here. <laughs> 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 Waff a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fixes oh every boy. problem. There's an entire section that should be added to Miter's attack just about WAFs, and it's just check marks for everything. Good to go. <laughs> Good to That's go. My bad joke for the day. I think it's not going to be the only one, Kevin. No. I wasn't <laughs> waffing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were edging. Uh. <laughs> Jeff, save the show, please. There. Save the show. <laughs> well, I have a couple <coughs> questions that I hope are related, but they're a little bit tangential. Um, I don't know how long ago Josh was on our show talking about uh, uh, you know, what were the common methods that they were successful doing pen testing. They'd done some kind of survey. Um, and, I, and I wanted to sort of bring that up again. And, it, and, it, and it's NIST-related. Um, but it's, you know, if it's, if you can indulge me, it's a little bit of a tangent. I want to talk about passwords. The recent, uh, update of NIST, whatever, 800 dash, whatever it is that talks about passwords and pass phrases and sort of abandoning, um, uh, expiring passwords or needing to change them nearly as often as certain, uh, compliance standards require. Um, in your experience as a pen tester, and Larry can pipe in on this too, uh, what I'm wrestling with and what I've been debating with some people in the last couple of days is, uh, is it necessary to change passwords even if there's, you know, really strong passwords, really long passwords, really complex passwords, password vaults, et cetera, and so forth? Given the propensity of people to, within the boundaries of what they're allowed to do, pick really crappy, easily guessed passwords, um, hopefully I can frame it in sort of an open-ended question. What are your thoughts on passwords, and in particular password expiration? Sure. So I'll tie that in with the Kerberos thing side, because that was a 25-character or more recommendation specifically. Wait, I thought it was 24 characters or more. It's 25, but... Regardless. It's C it's programming. I mean, when, you, when you're up oh. that high, it's... It uh, depends on where yeah. your offset starts at zero or yeah. one. <coughs> Anyways, um, so <laughs> passwords, right? The way, the way that I sort of think about passwords, um, and passwords are, are definitely, uh, you know, it's sort of the bane of the security community. They need They're to go easy away to and abuse. They, they need to go away and die. But, um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's... And in Windows, it's, uh, you know, it's even worse, as you guys know. Um, if we steal the hashes, then it's almost game over. That password doesn't even matter, but... Um, from, from that perspective, um, you really handle a couple of different pieces a little bit differently. So you take service accounts and I would handle those differently than user accounts. And then I would also mm -hmm. handle your domain admin or your privileged accounts differently from those. So some will say you shouldn't even have domain admins in the domain admin group. 
Yeah. So if you really know what you're doing yeah. in Active Directory, I feel like that should be prefaced mm -hmm. with that. Uh, and but, how many but, people really? But you're still going to have some level of server administrator yes, and, and some level of you know either enterprise admin or some some sort of uh, concept of administrator like account, mm -hmm. whether it's domain administrator or or whatever y you're using, um, some method to do some authentication. There. Correct. And so what I would say for users, um, pushing users towards uh, the 15 character um, approach is a good approach um, to do so. You know, there's there's obviously the adoption of, you know, are we changing this every 90 days, which is to your question. Um, mm -hmm. That's a painful, painful thing. So um, what we do is we recommend um, a 180 on that rotation um, instead of the, the every 90 days. And so that's that's a good approach in terms of, you know, how, how to handle well, that. Well, but if I may, what is your basis, you know, realizing that I think even in the back in the day, the 90 day rule, yeah. I think was somewhat arbitrary. Right. Uh, you know, so you're doubling it. Yep. You know, do you have any kind of basis for why you're making that leap? That's that's based on client feedback and, and really what we've seen sure. work for organizations. And if it's if it's doable for one organization and if it's doable for, for more than um, a number of organizations, then it's something that organizations can actually do. Uh, if, if, we're, if you're requiring, you know, um, you know, 360, um, 365, or if you're requiring 90, what's doable, you know, it's a trade-off for each organization and the culture in that organization will be different from another. So two organizations mm -hmm. may need to adopt their policies towards their specific business. And in the business context, um, I'm not saying it's, you know, it's the same for every organization, but uh, on the whole, uh, I kind of think of it as like usually, the, almost like the third the tier. Like it's more important that the password has length. Yeah. And I also think it's more important that you use a different password or users use different passwords for different systems or accounts so that their domain password is different from yeah. the password they use to log into, you know, whatever, like their Twitter account or whatever, right? So yeah. um, it, the third thing is, okay, yeah, maybe we need to change them more yeah. frequently yeah and, so, and I, I actually i'd put before that two-factor authentication although it has its issues and limitations does certainly yeah help. and wait, then wait password. for the news of the week well <laughs> news of the week aside yeah yeah right. just yeah yeah both, stories on both sides of that because yeah. cisco bought duo but yeah so <laughs> i i'd put right. that before and then i'd worry about how often i'm rotating my passwords yeah so so <clears throat> For us, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. The, the length is the most important for end users, uh, end user uh, credentials, and, and also administrators and even the service accounts um, mm -hmm. because obviously length maps to complexity for how long does it take to crack or guess. Yep. Um, and so if you're using the two-factor authentication, then you're mitigating you know, some portion of that. Not all services support two-factor. And so looking for those exceptions sure. and can we get in there? Yep, it's usually how Those it's are definitely... Um, and then the other side of the coin is where are you using those credentials? And so if you have two or two accounts, which most administrators would, mm -hmm. um, or more, then it starts to get into a management um, situation. Are you using Privilege Access Workstation to use a right. jump box? And does and that do require two-factor authentication? How do you know password is the same? And also, how do you know if the password is the same or different? Yeah. And Can't so you just compare the hashes? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so hey. it becomes much more than just password complexity. Mm -hmm. It becomes user identity management. Yes. It becomes yes. That's really configuration management. <laughs> It becomes how do these accounts tie together? Is there a cloud instance? Is there Okta? Is there, you know, a different provider? That sort of thing. And two-factor authentication. Duo? Yeah. Cisco Duo. Or 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 God forbid VPN well, with, without two-factor. Like that's and if that's I an may, easy way in. If I may, that's really what I was trying to get your your kind of feedback on to weigh yep. in on because there's so many other factors. You know, what is the the utility? of you know let's say simply uh increasing the length of the password given yes the the complexity goes up but given all the other things that you're describing um you know should you still be changing your password as frequently as 90 days maybe even more frequently and and if you would just to clarify because you're sort of you know you're sort of inferring it, but I would prefer if you stated explicitly uh, privileged accounts versus user accounts versus system accounts. 
which which ones need to have shorter password expiration, which can get away with longer. Yeah, just so there's no, no nobody's making well, an assumption. And Jeff, I'm, uh, along those lines, kind of like a, a follow-on or addition to Jeff's question is, when we think about hashes, password hashes, as they exist today in Active Directory, and granted different versions are in different conditions, right? Does it really take you 180 days to crack a password? Like if it's 90 versus 180, is that in your mind, both Larry and, and Josh, like related to how long it takes to crack that password? Or is it more about like that password got left around so like eventually we should change it because someone might find the hash? Well, once you find the hash, I mean, you guys aren't taking 90 days to crack a password. Most engagements are not 90 days, days right. 90 or 180 days. Yep. Yeah, I mean... Now, yep. that, now that said, um, you think about the math that it takes to create a 25-character right. password right. and the current math that it takes to crack that. If you're changing that every 180 days, you are well ahead of the math at the best yep. capabilities that I'm aware. I got you. I think well, quantum, quantum computing aside, brute yeah. force and not human tendencies and all the bad yes. habits that we know users have, point, and, yeah. yep. and, and and that's kind of what I'm getting at is you know we know as pen testers, you know, and we've talked about it on the show. You know, people talk about it being spring 2018 or summer 2018, or you know, it's their kids' names with a one, and then the next time it's a two, and and they rotate their kids. You know, there's, I mean, in the old days when I used to do this, uh, I was pretty good at just sitting. You know, we'd go on site, and I would sit down at somebody's desk, and you know, granted, you you literally could find the the passwords on sticky notes sometimes, but I could also look down, you know, sit down and and look at somebody's desk and kind of look at the pictures they had and the the nicks knickknacks and the tchotchke, and I was more successful. More, I was surprised at how successful I, I was at guessing passwords. You know, they got twenty seven little, uh, you know, statues or stuffed animals of all of, their children uh, of a pelican, <laughs> and I'm like, gee, I wonder if their password's like pelican one two three. Hey, it worked. You know, just <laughs> little stupid stuff like that, and and you know, it, 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 I mean, from a cryptographic sense, cryptographic attacks are designed to reduce the time it takes to do brute force uh, attacks and and not even getting into the cryptography of the tendency for people if they're uh, typing a random password supposedly random you know how often do they hit the you know in the days when people used full keyboard keyboards how often are they you know going left right left right left right or left left right right you know there's all sorts of human tendencies uh, that, that go that, that factor into you know, when you're doing a cryptographic attack at, 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 at trying to crack passwords, which a lot of the password cracking tools have a lot of that stuff built into. So, you know, just brute force is, I don't think, is a fair assumption to say, you know, you know 25 character passwords, it's going to take 37.8 billion years, you know, with our current computing capabilities. Because there's so many ways that we can we can cheat that by figuring out all sorts of different ways, or we can steal the hash. Sure. I, I or, think, pa I, or pass the hash. I, I think ultimately okay. to, to yeah. round that conversation uh, out, and I think all of you can agree, but I'm sorry, Paul, size matters. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if, why is he sorry to matter most? Oh. Well, and, and just a little bit more makes a lot of difference. <clears throat> yeah, it's so, true. Sorry, it's Paul. True. Sorry, Paul. If I could uh, jump in here and kind of Take the, the conversation back a second, Josh. Yes, if you please really change the subject. Know, <laughs> hey, go. Based on on your experiences of actually presenting uh, both the tiers or the MITRE framework, sure. where are you seeing the common trends? Where either the certain techniques are the most successful, mm -hmm. you know, broken either by tier or by the technique, or where are you seeing like the light bulb moment where where someone recognizes, I never thought of that. Have you noticed trends? Yep. Yeah, so we're looking at um, actually where does the MITRE attack framework sit into the maturity model for demonstration of risk. So often organizations will say we need to do a red team and we think we're ready for that. And we go in and we do something like a curb roasting style attack and we're successful. And we're mm -hmm. saying, let's look at the reasons why. And it maps back to de poor detection controls around, okay, you don't have this ability around your endpoints. Or we're able to do, you know, like a UAC bypass or able to use signed binaries that are already on the disk of the system. Uh, there's a utility called Mavinject, which is a Windows executable 
which does DLL injection, signed by Microsoft, and it's out there, and it's on systems. Living off the land. Um, so yeah, so this, this, this concept of leveraging what is already out there, what already exists in the environment, and does the organization have visibility into it? And so then, then the question shifts towards, well, what is your, your current detection capabilities? Do you have some endpoint uh, control? Do you have a SIM? Do you have you know size of the organization depending? Do you have, Do you have dedica dedicated resources? <laughs> Looking at you know your logs, and then are those being correlated in terms of like events and actually generating um, action and activity? So if you have a you have a SIM and it's you know this expensive device and it's doing all this great stuff, but no one's taking action on it. Well, that's 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 a little bit of a different story. Uh, if you don't, then that's maybe an indicator that you may need to invest more in terms of log correlation systems or you know looking at your endpoints uh, and being able to respond to these things. So, um, Josh, let me ask you this. Sure. What's the difference between a WAF and a next generation WAF? <laughs> you should be asking Kevin that. One of them is next gen <laughs> and one of them is not. <laughs> One of them, they add dash ng to the end. Yes, uh, uh, I think it has a lot to do with the marketing budget. Yes, yes, yes. Two point it's big. <clears throat> so, with with that, do you have a favorite technique in MITRE, or uh, based on how you've you've broken it out by tiers, like your your go to example? I mean, I I think I really just um, I like the curb roasting one. That's probably is my favorite one. Uh, because if you get on the box and you can do some bloodhound enumeration for where you're trying to achieve your objective, then you can do this escalation uh, mm. technique and you're, you literally haven't done any, any lateral movement at all. And you're not going to be uh, super loud or super noisy. Uh, yeah. And you can be successful in terms of achieving objectives using accounts that are supposed to access databases. <clears throat> if the data is in the database, we don't need to escalate to domain administrator access. This is a great attack and it fits really well with a red team style approach or, you know, maybe if you're doing a pen test or whatnot. So it's mm -hmm. one that um, you may want to look at uh, even if you're not doing purple stuff, so. Well, I think this is great to help raise awareness in folks that are defending enterprises. Yes. Of just how, and I think specifically we focused on Active Directory, which I think the minor attack framework is really, uh, well, they have a Linux and then so they have, OS they have, 10 one, they right? Have, they have one for Mac, they <coughs> have one for Linux, mm -hmm. and they have one for Windows. Windows is the biggest because yeah. a lot of people you know, use it a lot. In terms of the industry, what we're seeing is we're seeing organizations come to us and they say, you know, we're going to do a purple board that's going to be focused on the, the you know, the AWS, or the mm -hmm. cloud or, or whatnot. And, you know, those are mostly, you know, Linux systems. Uh, and so this, these things do play there. Mm -hmm. And and so um, they're important to with, not be missed. With Active Directory. And then uh, the integrations between those mm -hmm. uh, is where it becomes really scary. Mm -hmm. Compromise your corporate environment and there's a link to the cloud environment and that's done through some sort of uh, Active Directory credentialed access or you know, some sort of, you know, maybe you have your credentials on Windows systems and we can seal the SSH keys, right. pivot laterally or access cloud instances using you know, domain credentials mm. and then it becomes so more what, of a cloud so what you're saying, So what you're saying is you can have the greatest, most secure technology and often it falls apart if it's, if it's not implemented correctly. Absolutely true. Hmm. I was going to say if... I uh, have to be able to configure and test it um, to get that assurance. Security folks are trying, you know, looking at Active Directory going, oh my God, it's insecure by design. Yeah. And having a tough time working with their Windows team, maybe collectively, there are some cha significant challenges to overcome with the security or lack thereof in Active Directory. Um, they can turn to the NIST cybersecurity framework and the MITRE attack framework and specifically the tools you're about to release and a lot of yep. other frameworks as well. Yeah. Uh, but you've broken down into tiers, which is great. Yeah. But they can bring that and start the conversation and start to understand and maybe help others in the organization, like executives understand just how bad this problem is and how it needs to be an area of focus. And then once you do it for Windows, you can also do that for your Linux systems too, Yeah. which, which is nice. Exactly. Or so maybe you start with Linux. So I guess it depends on your environment. Our TTP coverage actually includes a lot of the Linux mm -hmm. side as well because it just it made sense to well, do it. Well, there's already for modules like, in there for Metasploit. You know, so, you know yeah. Bash RC stuff and like you know things like that. Um, you can stick you know, shell commands in, in a whole bunch of different places. You know, cron jobs and a whole bunch of places. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the purple side, a lot of the uh, engagements that we've been on, they're very collaborative. Where it's you know you're working really closely to be able to you know. If it, this is the concept of red and blue making blue better, 
then this is a highly collaborative, iterative approach that really just results in the organization being able to detect things um, over time and, and just improve that. Awesome. Mm. Well, Josh, are you, you're sticking around? Yes, I am. Okay. So yes. we're going to take a short break, come back. Perfect. And do Larry's technical segment. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> 